I remember coming back to Sweden and telling my friends, getting a job in Hollywood is a walk in the park. It's so easy. You just show up and Ben Stiller's there and you read a couple of lines that they fly you business class and they send a guy to the airport with a sign with your name on it. Reality hit me when I landed and uh, it took me three years to find my next job. Zoolander, that was my first job in the United States. It was two years into my career and I was doing a play in Stockholm at the time. And I obviously didn't have a representation or anything in the States and was there hanging out with my family and, and my father's manager just asked like, well, would you want to, I can send you out to an audition if you want, if you think that'd be fun. And I thought, well, why not? I'm here and that'd be a great story to tell my friends back home. So I went and it was for this movie called Zoolander. I read a scene and went home and thought that was it. And they called me back and wanted me to come in and meet with Ben and Reed with, with Ben Stiller. So I did that and then they called and said, you got the job. And a week later, they flew me business class to New York City and I got to shoot with uh, with Ben Stiller, who I thought was incredible. And not only Ben, but the other guys were so cool. And we drove down Broadway in that Jeep, if you remember singing like, Wake Me Up, the Wham song, just being goofy and stupid. And it was like, I couldn't believe my luck. Like I get to do this and they're actually paying me for this? This is stupid. If you see the movie, I'm in it for like three seconds and die in a gasoline fight or a tragic death. <laughs> For me, it was obviously a profound experience and quite different from working on a small stage in Stockholm. I was vaguely familiar with that world. I'd done, I wouldn't call myself a model, but I was, I'd done a little bit of it. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I loved it. Melancholia. There are a couple of times where I've just basically said yes before even reading. When I heard that Lars wanted me in this film, I said yes, and I told my agents, I don't care what else is out there, I'm gonna go to Sweden and do this. The movie is about the end of the earth, <laughs> and it was one of the most lively and fun sets I've ever been on. Most people expect it to be more authoritarian, that he'd be more of a tyrant on set, and that it'd be more tension on set, and it's just, uh, like the, the, the polar opposite of that. Everyone felt so liberated. The way he shoots is, I remember the first day I had a scene with Kirsten Dunst and, and we're in a, in, in a stretch limo on, our way, on the way to our wedding. And it's scripted, but it's also quite loosely scripted. So he, he gave us the kind of the rundown, talked us through the scene, but he wanted some improvisation. And then he said, at, at a certain point, Alex, the car is stuck on this road. And at a certain, at a certain point, maybe you step out to help the, the driver from, from outside the vehicle. And I asked, well, so which side would you prefer? Because with more traditional filmmaking, the director has a plan, well, well, I'm gonna shoot the master from this side, so it's good if you come out here because then I see you. If you're on the other side, I won't see you. And he just looked perplexed and he was like, well, I don't know, whatever you feel like doing, do what you gotta do and then I'll follow you. And again, we had some of the finest actors in the world, John Hurt and Charlotte Rampling, it was just, you know, extraordinary actors. It felt like everyone turned into a little kid because everyone like was so excited about the freedom and the sense of trust that he would instill in all of us. Just his uh, mode of rating was basically just do your thing and I'll find you. But then he'll come in and whisper something. Cause, uh, I, can you do this? Can you say it that way? Or can you pick up the postcard when she looks down or do, the, like it can be very specific. It's not like he's like, oh, do your thing. I'm just gonna sit here and drink my cappuccino. Like he knows exactly what he wants. One second be on the other side of a ballroom with 200 extras. And then the next second he's in your face with a camera and find something, you know, it's, it was uh, so wonderful. And the first time I got to work with my dad as well, he plays my, my best man on, in, in, at, at my wedding, a real douchebag. Uh, the character, not my father. Generation Kill. I was having a hard time professionally in 06, 07, because again, I was quite disillusioned by the hubris I had after Zoolander thinking like, oh, I'll just fly over to LA and book another great job. I rarely got to read anything I was excited about. And if I ever found something that had some substance or a role that was interesting to me, a big name actor would come in because great roles are far and few between. Then Generation Kill came up in 07 and uh, this was by uh, David Simon and Ed Burns who created The Wire. It's based on 
uh, a couple of articles from Rolling Stone magazine by Evan Wright that he then expanded into a book, and I, I, I thought it was just the most riveting story ever. The character of Brad Colbert, Iceman, was, um, it was just a dream role. I was certain that I wouldn't get it because it was too good. But audition a couple of times, and fortunately for me, they didn't want a big name actor. They wanted to cast the whole show with relatively unknown actors. So that's kind of uh, how I ended up getting it, I believe. We spent seven months in Southern Africa and Namibia, Mozambique, and, and South Africa. We didn't have our families out there. People didn't have their girlfriends out there. It was just 40 dudes stuck in the desert. Not to compare too closely to, to uh, being in the military, but there's a lot of hurry up and wait that's a lot of that's something you, you experience a lot in both the military and on a movie set because there's so many massive scenes with tons of humvees and you know just to reset could take 45 minutes that creates a very specific dynamic when you're 40 dudes and you sit around 12 hours a day just talking just you know you make fun of each other of yourself and uh, it, it you know it, it creates a very you know uh, a strong bond. Well, it goes a little different. We could all got killed today. <laughs> don't pet a burning dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn, she pet one today, didn't we? Goddamn. We're still a very tight group. We still see each other all the time and uh, hang out, and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly privileged and proud to be a part of that. True Blood. Well, it's actually quite interesting how I ended up getting the role, because I'd met with Alan Ball, the, the creator of the show, and then my agents got a phone call five months into our shoot on Generation Kill. He asked if I was interested, and I said, absolutely, but there's a slight problem. I'm in Maputo, and I'm here for another two months. I'm shooting Generation Kill. And Alan was like, well, that, that sucks, because we're about to shoot this in a month or so, and we, you know, unfortunately, it looked like I, was, I wasn't gonna be able to do it. Then the writer's strike happened. Thank God for the writer's strike. If you were already in production and the scripts were written, you were fine, but the True Blood scripts weren't written, so they had to push. I was able to finish Generation Kill in Africa, come back to LA for them to cast uh, Eric Northman. So that's how it happened. <laughs> Even though I have a terrible memory, I do remember a lot of that show. We, it was seven incredible years, and uh, what a ride that was. And, the very first night was special because it was the first time I met Stephen Moyer and Kristen Bauer, who plays Pam, my vampire daughter on the show. These were people that then became some of my closest friends. And, but the first night, Kristen had just flown in from the Philippines. She'd done a movie out there, so she was all very jet-lagged and nothing made sense. And I was, she was very kooky, and I was like, what's going on here? And there's a shot of us walking out of Fantasia, and, and then... Kristen and I are supposed to fly off, and the way they shot that was they put us on a skateboard with a rope and started pulling us. And I knew that this was a big show, like they had some money, but they're pulling us on a skateboard. That's the visual effect. So I was, I was slightly concerned. <laughs> and then again, she turned out to, like, I, I, I love her more than anything, and she's one of my favorite people. And uh, somehow they figured out a better way to make us fly after that. Good night, tiny humans. Whoa, he can fly! Battleship. Well, I'd never done anything uh, like Battleship before. The, I was just intrigued to do something of that scope. I met with Pete Berg, the director, a bunch of times, and he was very inspiring. I just loved his energy and his vision. And, and again, it was just kind of out of my comfort zone. It was very different from the smaller indies I'd, I'd done before. So I was quite excited to go and do something big and, 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 and a bit more like like a tentpole action film. What's it like doing a lot of green screen acting? It's one thing if it's a backdrop, then it's, it doesn't affect the acting really, but if you're gonna have an emotional moment with an animal or a human, and that's, it's, a, it's a tennis ball on a, on a C stand, it can be a bit more challenging. You know? Legend of Tarzan. We started four months before principal photography with Magnus, my, my trainer. And this was all new to me. I'd never worked with a personal trainer before. I'd never been on a specific diet before. So for three months, we, uh, I just ate a lot. It was basically 7,000 calories a day, just bulk up. I would lift weights, not do any cardio, because I'm naturally quite lean. So if I did any cardio, I would lose weight. And then about six weeks before we started shooting, he would change the diet and the training a bit to try to get more lean. So you would kind of 
hold on to the muscle mass, but get rid of uh, any any fat. Whatever happens, do not interfere. Understand? Mm-hmm. I went a bit nuts, actually. We shot it in London, and I remember on Sundays, my day off, I would walk around the area I, I, I lived in and just look into restaurants and look at people eating. There was one Italian restaurant around the corner. I just like would stand outside and look in, like as they were eating pizza and pasta and stuff, and I'd be like, oh wow, one day, one day I'll get to eat that. On Tarzan, the sets were real, but the animals weren't. So uh, that was a stuntman in a jumpsuit. I, I believe that was the first day we met. So we met on set, shook hands, and then went down on all fours and started rubbing against each other. It's a very bonding experience, literally. Big Little Lies. Very, very intense, but such a well-written character. He, he's uh, an abusive husband, but not written in a, in a stereotypical way. There's a lot of depth to the character, and I, I also love the way he was introduced. You kind of like this guy, hopefully, in the beginning of the show, and he's a great dad, and he's great with Celeste, his wife. They have a very strong, beautiful connection, and then slowly you start to see that there's another side to him, and there's a darkness there, and something he, that he genuinely is struggling with. You're hurting me. Oh, I'm hurting you. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting to kind of explore that because that's how you make it interesting for the audience, I, I, I believe. I think we, we have a tendency to, we're naturally, organically quite lazy and we want to sit back, especially when we watch television or movies. We make it easy for ourselves. We go like, okay, I get it, good guy, bad guy, because most stories are quite generic that way. It's fun if you can introduce a character in a, in a, in a, in a nice and charming way and get the audience to like him and then they start to question that and like, wait a minute, I, I kind of like this guy and now he does this and most people are conflicted and they have a, 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 a bright, beautiful side, but there's also a darkness there. I think it's that dichotomy that creates, um, a, a, you know, a, a real interesting character. Hold the dark. I had the best time on Hold the Dark. I think Jeremy Saunier, the filmmaker, is one of one of the greatest filmmakers out there. He's got a very unique eye and sensibility. And the script, is, it's based on a novel that I love. It's such a dark, rich, disturbing world. The character is unlike anything I've ever played before. There's a profound darkness there. He loses a child and then um, he sets out to avenge the death of his son and nothing can stop him. That trajectory and that kind of that determination was <clears throat> quite wonderful to, to explore. It takes place in Alaska, a little bit in, in um, Afghanistan or Iraq, where you first meet my character, but the rest of it takes place in Alaska and we shot it in, in Alberta, up in the woods in last winter. So and that was a great experience because we were out there and it was freezing cold and it just added a lot of texture to the, to the story. You're the one fault, my boy. Yes. Do you raise the dead? No, sir. Then I have no questions for it. Hidden. Well, it was a very intense shoot. The guys had done a, a three-minute short that I saw, and I thought it was really good. And then I met them, and they were late twenties at the time. But I could tell that they, you know they, they they had something very unique. They were very very smart, and they knew exactly what they how they wanted to tell the story and were heavily influenced by early uh, Spielberg and, and that kind of that, that, that visual language. It was a tough shoot because it's basically three characters in a basement for 85% of the movie. It's Andrew Riceberg who plays the mother and <clears throat> I'm the dad and it's about a couple and their, their daughter hiding in a post-apocalyptic movie about a family hiding in a bomb shelter. And then there's a twist towards the end. But it was, yeah, it was a tough one because I had to lose weight for it so I was kind of running on fumes for two months. I was always starving and um, to try to look emaciated. And I, uh, so I had very low energy and we were in this dark basement and there was like a fire going off and there was like rats running around and kids crying. It was just like a, a lot of darkness. <laughs> but they are incredible and I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled for them today with their success with, with Stranger Things because they, they deserve it. They're hardworking guys and, and incredibly talented. 
the little drummer girl so the little drummer girl is a uh, six-part limited series it's based on a John Le Carre novel and directed by Park Shan Wook Korean filmmaker did um, the old boy trilogy and handmaiden Stoker I've been obsessed with the old boy trilogy since I was a teenager I think they're extraordinary films this was kind of like when I got the call from Larson Trier. This was another one where I basically said yes before even reading it. A young girl, a British actress, goes to Greece on vacation. She meets a guy on this island and he suddenly invites her on this little trip to the mainland to go to Athens and go for a little drive for a couple of days, drive around Greece. She's like, well, this could be a cool adventure. And then she discovers that uh, his intentions are far from romantic. He's actually uh, a spy. That's kind of how the story kicks off.